Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we are deep into week six of our daily histories videos. Um, and today we're gonna stay downtown. We're gonna be on Calvert Street, right around the Battle Monument. And let's uh, first go to the Continental Trust Company building. It was built in uh, 1901, before the 1904 fire. Um, and that's gonna be important in a second here. Um, and its architect was a guy named Daniel Burnham. And Daniel Burnham was the architect for the 1893 Chicago uh, Columbia Exhibition, I believe was the title. Um, if you've read the book, The Devil in the White City, um, uh, that's the Burnham that we're talking about. Uh, he built the building, the 1904 fire happened, um, and the building was damaged. It was right in the heart, the heart of the 1904 fire uh, burnt uh, zone. Um, but Burnham built the building with a skeleton of steel work inside. <clears throat> one of the earliest examples of using steel uh, for the structure of a building. Um, and after the fire, uh, Burnham came back and took a look at his building and he sort of majestically announced that it was as good as the day it was built and uh, that they could go ahead and clean it up and reuse it. Um, and that they did. In fact, after the 1904 fire, uh, swarms of architects and engineers descended on Baltimore to study how fire affected different building materials and things like that. And if you've ever been to the Engineers Club uh, on Mount Vernon Place, um, they got their start actually uh, after the 1904 fire with uh, engineers, professional engineers coming and taking a look at what worked and what didn't. And steel definitely worked. In fact, uh, steel worked so well, if proven by Baltimore's fire, it's one of the reasons that it took off and became the predominant building material that it is today. Um, probably the most uh, famous person to work in the Continental Trust Company building um, was a gentleman named DeShiel Hammett. Um, he worked for a, a group, not the Continental Trust Company, that was a financial firm, uh, which incidentally, uh, one of the things it did was put together a bunch of Baltimore gas and electric companies and combine them into what we now know today as BG&E. But uh, DeShiel Hammett did not work for them. He worked for a company called the Pinkert Detective Agency. They're the group that uh, was hired by uh, sort of robber barons, railroad robber barons and, uh, and mining company operatives to go squash labor unrest. Um, but DeShiel Hammett didn't, uh, didn't stay with them for long. He became a novelist. And if you know some of his early novels, um, there's a famous character uh, named the Continental Op who works for the Continental Detective Agency. Um, is that sounding familiar? Young gentleman working in the Continental Building in Baltimore. Probably his most famous uh, novel is The Maltese Falcon. And if you take a look above the door uh, to the building, you'll see two tremendous bronze eagles. And we don't have a whole lot of proof, uh, but I'm not sure it's too much of a speculation to see a young man walking to work every day underneath those eagles, later on becoming a novelist, uh, and making a connection with uh, the name of his novel to those eagles. All right, let's go up the, uh, up the road a little bit, just a block, and we're gonna talk about the Clarence Mitchell Courthouse. Uh, we're gonna spend a whole five minute video on Clarence Mitchell, so we're gonna skip over him only for now. Um, famous and important uh, civil rights activist. But let's take a look at the building itself. And I wanna focus on really two or three things. The first are the incredibly large columns uh, up on the second floor. Uh, the building was built in 1900, I believe, um, and its architects were a firm called Wyatt and Nolting. And they got the commission to do this from the U.S. Treasury Department. The building was built as a federal courthouse and the U.S. Treasury was paying for it. So by the rules of the game back then, they had a national competition and those two won um, with their design that includes these enormous columns. Each one is 35 tons. Um, and stands 31 feet high, which just so happens to be seven feet higher than the columns in front of the U.S. Uh, Capitol building, but who's counting? Um, uh, we think they are the biggest single stone, each one is a single stone, and we think they're the biggest single stone columns in the country and maybe the world. The other thing, if you look right above the main door, you'll see two tremendous lions, or, or a number of tremendous lions, um, last time we talked about lions as grotesques to keep away evil spirits. Um, certainly no evil spirits coming in the front door there. And even if you go to the side doors, the wonderful bronze side doors, you'll see lions on the door handles as part of the door handles. So if you're an evil spirit and you want to try to sneak in the side door, um, kind of forget about it. All right, we're going to go to our third building. Again, just up the block a little bit. Um, and this one is the former Federal Reserve Building. It was built in 1926, so a little bit later. 
Um, and it was uh, the Federal Reserve Bank's building in downtown Baltimore. The bank uh, then went on to have a number of different buildings. And now I believe is consolidated. I think it's a single building is the, the, the big building by the stadiums. But for a number of years, it acted as the Federal Reserve. Um, incidentally, there's a, there's a huge reinforced tunnel between the Federal Reserve Building uh, and the former U.S. Post Office Building, which is now the courthouse on the east side of Calvert Street, um, used to, I guess, carry securely cash and securities between the two. Um, but let's take a look at two elements of this building. The first are the iron grates uh, outside of the windows. And if you take a look at them, there's some really neat symbolism going on. You'll see the symbol, uh, a crest with F and R on it, the letters F and R. We can make sense of that, Federal Reserve. Um, and then some animal figures. We see eagles um, atop the grates. Uh, eagle, the symbol of the United States, that makes sense. And then if you look over a little bit, you'll see pelicans. And you think, wait a minute, what's, uh, what's Miami doing in Baltimore at a Federal Reserve Bank in 1926? Well, they're, they're not Miami pelicans. Um, pelicans uh, have been used as a symbol for ages and ages, um, usually as a symbol of constancy. So that also kind of makes sense. We want our federal bank building to be constant. Um, but they've also been intertwined into masonry. And uh, we don't have any proof, uh, but yeah, I'll leave it up to you to speculate. Uh, maybe there's another layer of meaning to those pelicans. Uh, maybe the architects were, were masons. Finally, one, uh, uh, the last thing I want to cover is the doorway. And if you look at that great bronze door, it's got so much going on that you can hardly get your head around it. But I actually want to talk not about the bronze door, but about the stone surround, the stone around the bronze door um, that also has carvings in it. It is modeled after a church, St. Andrea, uh, the Basilica of St. Andrea in Mantua, Italy. And if you're an architect uh, fan, you probably know this building. If you're not, um, if you want a little taste of Renaissance Italy, um, go downtown and take a look at this door surround. Um, and it was the, the one in Mantua was designed by an architect named um, uh, Leon uh, Bas uh, Batista, I'm sorry, Leon Batista Alberti. Um, and he's credited as being the father of Renaissance Italian architecture. So he's really a pretty big deal. Um, and we've got a door surround that is modeled after his famous basilica in Mantua. And I'll leave with this. If you look at the surround, and if you look at the top corners, right uh, where they meet the bronze doors, you'll see two squirrels eating nuts, eating little acorns. And, uh, and when you're walking past next time, take a look, make sure you can see them. Um, and just remember that you are not looking at Baltimore gray squirrels eating pin oak uh, uh, nuts. You are looking at Renaissance Italian squirrels eating Renaissance Italian nuts. So with that, I think I'm gonna uh, say goodbye and we will see you tomorrow.